Hi guys and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at the Zoom L20 digital multitrack recorder. And one of the fantastic and interesting features about the Zoom L20 is that you can actually set up independent auxiliary sends for each channel. So what I thought we'd do today is record a vocal directly into the L20 as well as set up an independent auxiliary send directly out to a rack compressor. So we're going to send that exact same vocal track out to this DBX166XS rack compressor and then we're going to send it back to the L20 and record it. That's going to give us the ability to compare and analyse the audio in the digital workstation later. And another bonus with the Zoom L20 is that every channel has its own independent compressor built in. That's going to enable us to compare three separate tracks. The first, the direct recorded audio into the L20 multi-tracker. The second track will be the auxiliary send and return from the compressor back into the L20. And finally, the third is the directly recorded vocal, but utilizing the channel compressor turned on so we can compare that against the other two. Okay, so let's do a walkthrough of the Zoom L20. Well, first of all, you've got your power supply, which goes in the back here. In the slot next to it, you've got your USB memory stick. And the reason you need that is to import audio into the Zoom L20. We'll come on to exactly how to do that in a little moment. On the top panel, you can see there's the inputs and you've got 16 XLR and jack insert points. Each XLR input has its own independent channel. So you've got 20 of those because on track 17, 18 and 19 and 20, you've got stereo inputs. And then you've also got RCAs and these double up as USB audio send and returns. So you can actually use this as a door controller as well. You've also got phantom power, which is provided by engaging the red switches. That basically applies four channels at a time to each one of these red switches. You've also got a pad button on each channel. So if you've got a really loud sound source, you can actually add a pad in there just to soften the signal strength. Every channel has its own preamp built into it and you can control that via the gain dial just there. The preamp in the Zoom L20 are the best preamps they've ever made, they say. And I've got to say, they really do sound fantastic. Each channel also has a compressor built into it and you can have it completely off or you can start to apply however much of it you want using this dial. And you can also set that internally to either record pre-compressor, so straight to the recorder before you go to the compressor, or you can set that so it records after it. So you can actually, what they call, bake it in or print the compression if you're happy with the sound of it. Obviously you can never take that off if you do print with it. You've got your master out XLRs. Up here you've got six monitor outs which obviously can be sent to speakers or to headphones and there's actually a switch to engage either headphones or speakers and whether you're hearing the master mix or whether you're hearing an independent sub mix auxiliary mix which we'll talk about a little bit later too. You also have a select button, which is just for selecting whichever channel you're working on. So then you can route it to the EQ if you wish. So this long blue strip goes to the EQ here and you've got all your classic EQ controls, really useful, as well as a bunch of effects that you can choose as well. And the inbuilt effects are really good. There's a whole list of them and you can assign them independently. Then in this dark strip, you've got your record and play button, which is basically just how your arm or set your particular channel to play. Obviously you can use your faders to attenuate the volume of any channel, but if you don't need that channel at all, you can just leave it disengaged. Every channel has its own mute button and every channel has its own solo button. So a really useful mix of features there. There's a very efficient device and it's slimmed down to all the things you do need and none of the things that you don't. And this little section down here, this little cluster of buttons is how you monitor and set independent monitor and aux feeds and sends. Effectively what you can do is you can use the master to create a master mix. Then you can click over to submix A and then set a completely different mix and B and C. So you've got all of these different options of making unique mixes and then sending whichever mix you want up to the monitor out section here. So you can actually send it to speakers if you wish or you can send it to headphones. That means that the drummer, the bassist, the guitarist and the singer, they can all have their own unique independent channel set up so they can monitor just the instruments that they want to hear and at the particular volumes they want to hear them. We're going to look at this monitoring section today and I'll show you some advanced features on how to get the best out of this machine. These two blue sliders are the effects send and return, so you've got two channels of those and then you've got your master output. That's your master phone, so you can be listening to a completely separate mix to any of these guys. So effectively, you've got seven headphone or line outs. And then, of course, you've got your main control section with your menu, your toggle switch, which you press to actually select. And I'll show you some really cool features to do with these little very slim line buttons here. And everything works perfect, feels solid, no rattles, doesn't feel cheap, very high quality, really, really good stuff. Another lovely feature is that when you hit the power button and turn it on, you met with the screen illuminating and a lovely cascade of LED lights there across the board to show you that everything's working. 
and it only takes a second just to boot up and then it's ready to roll. There we go, looking good. So all these lights indicate the session that I was last working on. It remembers your last session effectively. So let's dive into this particular session. I'm gonna show you how to record on one channel, send that signal out from one of the independent submixers to a rack compressor, and then back in on a different channel and record that as well. And as a third element, we're gonna record the exact same dry signal with the inbuilt compressor. And we're gonna be able to compare all three. Of course, you can use any of these channels to record on at any time, but for our purposes and for our project today, we're going to be using these channels just here, just because it's close to the rest of the controls rather than working on the far end. So we want to keep things quite central. So what we want to do is we want to take our XLR cable from our microphone and plug it into the first channel. So this is going to be channel 16. We're going to engage phantom power and that's because this microphone is a condenser microphone, it's the Rode NT1. If your microphone's got a really, really hot preamp built into it, you might want to pad it to attenuate the signal strength, but in this case, we're fine as it is. So next, we're going to move down to the gain knob, and again, I know just from experience and using this device and this microphone, that about 12 o'clock is plenty gain. Really, effectively, all you're doing is you're trying to bring up your meter to 0 dB, and one of the things you can look out for is that when it goes above 0 dB, the LED segments next to it actually turn orange and then they go red if you start to clip. But I've run plenty of stuff into the orange and there's no clipping audible whatsoever, so there's a nice bit of headroom in those preamps. Now, because this is gonna be the direct dry vocal I'm recording, I'm gonna leave the compressor off. So effectively, even though it is engaged internally, I'm not gonna use it on this channel. I'm just gonna record the dry signal straight through. Now, if you wanted to use the EQ, you would hit the select button here, and that then sends this particular channel and any other channels that you highlight to the EQ, and you can independently tweak the EQ and then go to the next one, and it will remember and recall exactly where you set your EQ. I'm not gonna mess about with the EQ, I'm just gonna record the dry flat signal. Next, we're gonna arm our track so it's now ready to be recorded on. I'm not gonna obviously mute it or solo it, and then I'd listen to the audio coming through by pushing up the fader to 0 dB. The master's already at 0 dB. So now we need to understand how we're gonna route that signal and how we're gonna hear what's been played. Effectively, what I've got it set to at the minute is the master mix. So if we look down here at the submix section, you can see that I've got it set to master. That means that everything I set here will be fed through to the master phones here or the master signal selected up here but we're gonna do something a bit tricky and a bit more advanced here. Even though I've got that set to zero dB, anything I sing into the microphone is gonna come through this channel. I've got the full track mixed and inserted onto channels 17 and 18. Now what I wanna do is I wanna be able to send this audio signal, so the incoming vocal, to an outgoing auxiliary send. So now what I do is I select in the monitoring section, A, and now we're in submix A. So that effectively means that I can turn backing music off completely. So the only thing being output is this vocal. And you can see the two lights here indicate that that's where this fader was previously set. So you just push the fader up until it disengages those settings and then back down so it's not engaged in any way. So now we've got submix A set up. What I want to do is revert back to master and then I want to push up my audio so I can hear it. So now we know that channel 16 direct vocal has been sent to channel A independently. I can now connect a TRS or a tip ring sleeve jack, plug it directly into A, that is sending the direct vocal out to the rack compressor. I found that having the output set to about 10 or 11 o'clock is absolutely ample amplitude. Anything much more than that and you're gonna cause feedback. And you can choose whether or not you have the master mix or depressed it is mix A. So now we've got submix A going through there. And when you press this button, you're engaging the line level signal out through your cable to your rack compressor, which is the kind of signal strength that any rack compressor is expecting to see. So to get the compressed vocal coming back in from the rack compressor, you take the output from it, which in this case is an XLR cable, and you plug that in the channel next to it. And now I'm gonna set this to record as well. And because I wanna hear or monitor the audio coming back in from the compressor, I only really wanna hear the vocal from that compressor, so I'm gonna move that up to zero dB. So now we've got a dry signal recording and we've got a compressed version too. Now this is a big word of warning. Whatever you do, don't increase the volume of the dry recorded vocal at the same time as the actual compressed vocal. And that's because you'll create a feedback loop where the vocal's going in and round and it's basically creating feedback. It'll blow up your speakers or your headphones and it's really, really unpleasant and it's certainly not good for the device. So if you have that happen to you, it's usually because you're monitoring both audio signals and you only really need to listen to the compressed version. Or if you wanted to listen to the dry version, you could also listen to that. It's your call completely, it's your preference. 
Well, that now is remembered as mix master. So that is what you're monitoring as the master through your headphones. So when you insert your headphones, you're now gonna be able to hear the master mix coming through into those headphones, controlled via this dial here. And again, about 10 o'clock seems to be ample loud enough to be able to get a really good signal. So the other cool thing you can do with the Zoom L20 is to use the dry vocal that's coming in on channel 16 or whichever channel you choose and send it again out to a different mix bus. So if we then flick our monitoring section to mix B, now I wanna send channel 16 only, just the dry vocal out through B. So I'm gonna replicate that setting and send into channel here. What you want to do to set the L20 up is to press the menu button and then you can go to project, new project or select a project, whatever you want to do. You can select which folder the track might be in, record and play, have a look at those settings. Now the recording format's important. I always want to record in 24 bit, but you can choose to decrease that to 16 if you wish. Once you've selected whichever one you want, you just press this push button just here to select it. Record source is an interesting one, and that's how we allocate the pre-compressor or the post-compressor recording. So if you choose pre, that means that the signal is recorded direct after it's hit the preamp straight to the hard disk. But if you wanted to record with the internal compressor engaged, then you'd select post-compression. And that'll record the direct signal in through the preamp, into the compressor, and straight to the SD card. And to come back out of any layer, you just press menu and it takes you back a layer back into the main menu. You can select to turn on your metronome and you can select what kind of sound you have and the pattern and the volume and all the rest of it. System basically just gives you access to the time and date. You can set the contrast. You can actually have an external controller and you can check your firmware version. Slate is referring to this microphone just here. Normally in the old studios, they'd have what's called a slate mic and they'd use that to talk to the band on the other side of the glass. You can mess about with the controls for that. If somebody's in a different live room, you can use that as a microphone and it works perfectly well and I've used it and it sounds really good and clear. So no issues, you don't need a separate microphone to be able to do that. That's really handy to have that, it's a nice little professional touch. And of course you're back to the beginning of the menu now indicated by this scroll bar on the side. Now the key controls that you're gonna be using all the time are the stop, play or pause button and of course the record button. Now, if you plan on doing overdubs like I am, it's absolutely vital that you press this overdub button. Every time you turn on your L20, that will be by default set to off. So every time you press record, you'll be starting a whole new project every single time. So it's really important that you turn on the overdub button if you're planning to overdub multiple tracks onto some backing source or just on any of the other tracks if you're overdubbing. That'll stay on for the whole project time until you power it off again. So you don't need to keep turning it on and off every time. And of course you've got your jog or shuttle buttons that go forward and back. So when you press play on a project, at any time when your track is playing, you can just push the button and it'll set a marker. So now it's added mark one. If I press stop, if I click back, it'll go to mark one. Or if I press forward, it'll go to mark two, which I've already pre-programmed. And one final thing here is that this push button is also a shuttle button. So you can turn it forward or backwards and it'll jog you through your track. So you can pinpoint exactly where you wanna be, press enter and it'll insert a mark. And if you wanna get rid of one of your marks, you just click whichever one it is. So go back to mark one and then press it again and it just undoes it. So super, super simple, super easy. Okay guys, so we're here in the door and we're going to use this software to be able to compare the quality of the vocal that we recorded direct to the Zoom L20 and we're going to compare that to the version we sent out to the rack compressor and we're also going to compare that to the internal compressor that we used on the third channel and through our analysis hopefully we'll be able to see and hear which of them sounds the best. Now with the Zoom L20 it is entirely possible to go completely doorless, but for our purposes today I've removed the SD card from the L20 and I've put it into the computer so we can actually have a look. So this is the SD card, and as you can see, the L20 is auto-generated 10 folders, and within each folder, there's different projects. Now the project that we've been working on is within folder one, and it's called new one, and there are our audio tracks. We don't need to transfer tracks 17 and 18 because that's the original stereo audio file, but what we need are tracks 16 back to 10, and they're all the separate vocals. So what I'm gonna do now is rename them so when I import them into my actual folder on the computer, I don't get the confused for anything else. Okay, so I've just flown through these tracks and I've renamed them something meaningful. So we've got 
direct vocal one, two, and three, and each one of those was sent out to the rack compressor, so basically that corresponds to one, two, and three. And the reason that these vocals are split across three separate channels is that when I'm tracking vocals, what I like to do is have a verse on one channel, then maybe a bridge, and then a chorus on a separate channel. So it just makes life easier when I'm trying to drop in and out myself. So these files are all going into the Midnight Silver Moon files. So now let's import those vocal tracks into the project. OK, so we zoomed in on the vocal tracks only. What we've got here is verse 1, followed by the bridge, followed by the chorus, there's an interlude, and then verse 2. That's what we've got so far. But I think today we're just going to listen to verse 1, bridge, and the chorus. So let's start off by listening to the dry vocal only. OK, here we go. If you can't feel it, I can't see this happening The state we're in are real then we must deal with everything unless you're scared hold me till you're dying till you said it babe hold me till the day i reach this one how come you don't know let me be baby how come you don't know Okay, so everything sounded quite even, but if we zoom in a little bit closer, one thing that stands out to me that I'm hearing and I'm also seeing is that there's quite a lot of peaks going on here. There's quite a lot of plosives, there's quite a lot of sharp S's, there's a lot of sibilance going on, and that's pretty standard for any directly recorded dry vocal. And you can visually see that the waveform's a lot more spiky than it is down here on the compressed version, where everything looks a little bit more fatter and a little bit more tamed. The peaks aren't quite so high, and the dips aren't quite so low. So now let's have a listen to the vocal tracks that were sent out to the DBX rack compressor and see if we can hear a difference. Here we go. If you can't feel it, I can't see this happening The state we're in If you are real, then we must deal with everything Unless you're scared Hold me till you're dying, then you said it, baby Hold me till the day I reach this one How come you don't know lately, baby? How come you don't know? How come you don't know lately, baby? How come you don't show? Okay, so to me the vocal just sounded way more present, way more upfront. You'd expect that from a compressor. I thought that rack compressor did a really great job. Really happy with it. It's only applying maybe between 3 and 5 dBs of compression, so we've still got plenty of peaks. You can see nothing's been squared off. Really, really nice sound. I'm really happy with that. So let's listen to the final version, which is the dry vocal sent into the internal Zoom L20 compressor and see if there's a difference. We can see here already that the actual waveform looks quite big and chunky, but there still are quite a few spikes in there. So obviously we didn't apply too much compression, which would have led to a really squished sound. Um, but hopefully this is going to retain some decent quality as well. So let's have a listen. Here we go. You can't feel it, I can't see this happening The state we're in If you are real then we must deal with everything Unless you're scared Hold me till you're dying, then you said it baby Hold me till the day I reach this one How come you don't know lately baby how come you don't know lately, baby? How come you don't show? Okay, so really nice, and I'm very impressed with that. Because it's only a one knob compressor, I was being quite cautious with the application of it. I probably only turned the dial up to about nine o'clock, so it was only using about a quarter of its power. And I've got to say it's applied just a decent amount of compression there. It's brought things a lot more further forward, but it's still kept a lot of the transients intact. The worst thing you can do with a vocal when you're applying compression and printing like this is that you can overcook it, and then you just can't get those dynamics back. It's much better to maintain the dynamic range so you can manipulate it in the door or on the L20 in the mixing stage. 
Now one thing you've got to consider is that the rack compressor has a lot of controls. You can control the knee, the attack, the ratio of the compression. So yeah, some good options there. I'm really happy with the dry signal. Again, the preamps sound fantastic, really, really nice. They obviously preserved the whole vocal really well. The rack compressor is doing a sterling job and the inbuilt compressor has worked really nicely too. So if you don't have a rack compressor to send out to, I think using a little bit of the actual inbuilt compressor is a viable option.